Okay, everybody, we are going to get underway. Welcome to Cafe Lena. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, Joe, actually, that was a misunderstanding of the sign language. We're going to leave the lights on so that we can all see each other. And there they go, just like that, pure magic. All right, so it's great to see you here. Thanks for coming in on a, on a sunny Saturday afternoon in Saratoga Springs. And uh, thanks for being part of the coffee house tradition, uh, which is listening to music, making art, and having meaningful conversations about the situation that we have gotten ourselves into. <laughs> so we're here today with Bruce Piasecki, and we also have Gordon Lambert with us, an old friend of Bruce's. And there's nothing that makes your mind flow into conversation better than to uh, set it to some good music. So Gordon is gonna play some music, just help us focus, center in this space, and then, uh, and then Bruce will be getting on stage and uh, introducing Mia, who's behind me. All right, great. So Gordon, thank you so much for bringing some music. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone. I'll just do a quick short instrumental and then one other piece that I've uh, written for uh, this introduction, uh, and then we'll hand it over to my good friend, Bruce. Thank you, and it's now my pleasure to introduce my friend Bruce. And uh, I was thinking about how to do this and was reflecting on a great songwriter, uh, Dolly Parton. And there's a great tune that Dolly Parton has written called The Coat of Many Colors. And I think that metaphor is really a powerful one. I think each of us in our own way as we lead our lives live our lives, uh, we are making our own coats of many colors. And certainly my friend Bruce has a very colorful coat. And as an author, I think what makes him special and anyone who's writing is that 
they're making their coat of many colors transparent to us and known. And that takes, you know, courage. Uh, uh, and also he shares observations that he takes from other people's coats of many colors. So I just want to uh, leave that with you as a, a thought as Bruce shares some of his life experiences, his uh, insight, and uh, his, his reflections. Bruce? So, I am 15 years old, and that's a good half century ago. The sun on Long Island Beach 5 is strong and illuminating every little pore on my back. I have hurt my right knee badly. The head coach at West Isla Pie has moved me up to play varsity at 15. And in ninth grade, the world is bent to stuff my shot. Um, I am hurt. I am poor. I live by the railroad tracks. I need to fix myself. My sacred mother shows me an article about Walt Chamberlain and how he restored his damaged knees without surgery by walking miles on loose speech sand, and then running, and then lifting weights while walking, I began his routine. After a while, the teenager in me began daydreaming, not only of the blonde tan bodies in the swimsuits so loud, but also about what I wanted to do with my life. It seemed completely and overwhelmingly open to me. My dad was dead, my wonderful mom had her hands full with foster kids in poverty. I had time to walk many times on the beach, and the salty act of restoration began to seep in my cells. At this point, I want to introduce behind me a person beaming in from Paris, Mia Funk, who reminded me in an early interview on my life uh, that there are people interested in people who, like Ben Franklin, create a life for themselves. So that's one of the themes of today's time together. And I hope we can talk about things ranging from Putin to the present day by talking about how memory itself is a kind of accomplishment. To avoid this stressful mix of worry and fascination and boredom, I began throwing at the waves, rather violently, large, dry, Beach, sti beach sticks, then full sodden logs that I found on the beach. And then I began to write clever little messages in bottles from my mother's home and throw them in the ocean. Ben Franklin witty little messages in a bottle. And I imagined some girls in foreign countries reading what I had to say. And perhaps a publisher might see what I wanted to say. There was silence for many walks. But I began to de detect a message in reply. The large sounds of the ocean off of Long Island, its M and its momentum, its enormous rolling prospect, its universal appeal told me, be bold, be like an emu. I always had thought as a kid that the word emu was absolutely wonderful. Three letters like the word God. So my mother wanted me to worship God, and I did, but I also thought about emus. <laughs> In most angry lives, you crash, unable to sustain the surf. The beach and the waves and the ocean told me that vividly. In the things I threw at the sea, most were returned with some temporary foams to the shore unchanged as the small, fast birds picked at them and then got bored with what I threw in and returned to the snails and the mites and the sand. I was having no effect on the universe. One morning of particular intensity, I decided to transform my approach. I began throwing the sticks with a sense of science and physics 
further out near the white crests with less anger and more strategy. I noticed other things happening, the shape of the wood and the prayer in my words began to matter as did the wood type. It seemed the tide was itself beginning to start a dialogue with my ambitions. Most of the pieces of my anger crashed back into the beach line, but a few made it past the responding waves, about one out of 22. Where did those floaters go? To London, to the London I aspired to study Shakespeare in. To the outstretched arms of massive Australia, to the shores of the Caribbean, I did not know I was destined to be a factory kid. And in my ignorance and the need to know, I watched the floaters with more and more need. I took this as God's message that I should write books throughout my life that floated above the foam, that I should fling my imagination beyond blame, beyond hate, beyond idle and mounting anger, into the waves of my ordinary days, into the distant oceans. Five years after that experience at the beach at age 15, a moment of sudden, almost religious rightness occurred. I had changed by forces so much sweeter than myself, by a grace and a force and a fascination of my little concerns on the beach that allowed me to be born again, a writer. I changed with a deep, resolute certainty. Next, I became an undergraduate on full scholarship at Cornell, handling the attention of the crowds as a basketball player and trying to keep up with the competitors. I was bold enough by age 20 to allow my first book to be published, Stray Prayers. In it, I wrote, I am looking forward to looking back, but the inaccessibility of any future blinds me in a freshness. Come with me now as we explore the beachfront of my newest book, my 19th book, A New Way to Wealth, The Power of Doing More with Less. Uh, it will be in the back for you. I hope to talk with you about it, where you can feel the resolute turbulence in that book if you stick with me. So here we are at Cafe Lena, where conversation and music become prayer. In 1960, Lena Spencer opened this stage in Coffee House. The world grew tall around this place. The place grew tall with each successful performance. People saw and felt the tallness. They heard a lasting sound different than the normal crashes going around. They felt the music soulful and the musicians found themselves gifted. The places grew taller, their legends grew taller, sacred to the alert and the faithful to the sound of music. A former woodworking shop became a popular venue for musical innovation and social inclusion. By 1961, Bob Dylan played here on the same room. I want to shout out to Dr. Lou here in his 90s about his experience of 1981 when Bob Dylan played before you. Do you want to say a few words about that experience?
Well, that's the way legends are made, Lou. I appreciate your story. So I want you to know that also other famous people like Dylan started out or came here. Um, Don McLean, before his famous Bye Bye American Pie boom, was here. But for me, very important was the narrative technique of Spalding Gray. What a pisser that man was when I would listen to his stories. My mother had once said, Bruce, you spend so many words at dinner, I forgot what I ate. <laughs> but when I listened to Spalding Gray talk about having a massage in China, he spent at least 10,000 words mesmerizing me about the spy sensibility of China, about what it felt like and how difficult it was to relax as an American in China. Spalding Gray told wonderful stories here. So as, yes? Sure. So it, and she got in my too, so he's an guy that my Thank you, Lou. One of my concepts here today is to talk about how waves build momentum on waves, you know, so that one life touches another life and then leads us into a world of today and tomorrow. So thank you for that, Lou. I didn't know that. So by the end of her life, the legend of Lena Spencer's generosity to Dylan and McLean spread fast. The legend became as generative as a kangaroo and as piercing as an emu. This is the way history is made, by kindness and focus, not by war and violence. The next wave. Not long after this boom of attention, the storytelling tradition began to take off, as Lou just indicated. Spalling and others were not only fun, but they were fabulous. So here is my first takeaway for each of you. Despite being bruised and battered and defeated at age 15, storytellers and troubadours opened my style. They opened my life with a something stronger than a can opener for a teenager beer. In time, a protest song grew in me. This new book I'm going to tell you about is a song of protest. It's about how to be alive in an age of climate change. It's about how to trust the children of the future again and how to have faith and hope in this swift and severe world. And I hope you enjoy it. In keeping with Lena's devotion to presenting talent, Sarah Craig, who introduced us, is the current CAFE CEO and she continues this special mix of programming music and storytellers like myself. And rather than writing in the black and white of academic efficiency, I told myself I could write in color, narratives of discovery and hope. And all of the social inclusion and the social diversity of the music world meant a lot to me. As Leonard Cohen sings, you can enter the Tower of Song and strive to hear more clearly King David's, King David's chord. And in time, Cafe Lina became our country's most continuous and generous folk venue, a live stage for the future. A third wave. Now, my friends, who wrote this strange letter in a bottle? I'll quote from it. What makes America exceptional isn't our wealth, or size, or skyscrapers, or military power. It's the fact that America is the only nation in human history that is made up of people in every race, religion, and culture, from every corner of the globe. And that's what we have faith in, called democracy, our common creed to blend this hodgepodge of humanity into one people. Nothing symbolizes this truth more than our music. This is a quote I've taken from a book called Renegades, born in the USA by Barack Obama and Bruce Springsteen. These two men, 
plus Ben Franklin, the strong women in my family and life, plus the articulate paranoia of George Orwell, and especially the living legend of Bob Dylan, made this new book that I wanted to give to you. It is a song of protest, seeking solutions. I believe that if you seek solutions with an open mind, prejudice can never defeat our history, although it tries daily. After this next piece um, called Punishing Putin, um, I'm going to pause to create an interactive dialogue with Mia Funk from Paris. And Mia Funk uh, has created seven years ago one of the top 1% global podcasts in the world called The Creative Process. She herself is a renowned painter, and she also now has created an additional podcast series that I recommend to all of you concerned about energy and environment called One Planet Podcast. It's a very broad uh, experimentation with thinking about the role of business and society and leaders. So we're very happy that Mia has agreed to work with Sarah and the sound engineers and share this through her work on Spotify, Amazon, um, TuneIn, uh, and 71 universities, or 75 universities. So Mia, glad you're here with us. So this thanks is a piece. Sorry, Mia? Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I've been cutting in too early. Had you finished it? No, it's just a few words, and then yes. I'm going to, a few words from you, and then I'm going to read Punishing Putin. Great. Well, thanks for inviting me this evening, and it's a pleasure to meet you all. Um, Yes, so uh, as Bruce mentioned, a little bit about me. I'm an artist, writer, podcast host, and the Creative Process and the One Planet Podcast. Uh, the, uh, the Creative Process is an international educational initiative and traveling exhibition. Well, as Bruce said, One Planet focuses on the environment and the kind of world we're leaving for future generations. So we've been collaborating with Bruce for the last few months on a 10-episode limited series called Business and Society and interviewing a host of fascinating guests from environmental leaders, diplomats to writers, and uh, we're already halfway through the series and having great fun doing that. Um, and the, the podcast is published on our one planet for the environmental episodes with selected arts episodes, like this one appearing on our other channels. And um, the team and I are fortunate that, as Bruce said, to reach a wide audience and to be created in collaboration with over uh, 75 major universities. Um, and for me, why uh, I started it with our team, uh, it's important for me, I feel, to help the next generation to find their vision, as Bruce mm -hmm. shares this, this goal and this mission, uh, you know, by creating experiences that ignite imaginative inquiry. And for me, the arts and humanities and what you do there at Cafe Lina, they've always been my passion and have nourished me throughout my whole life. I believe that the arts are the glue that holds society together, and they remind us that we need to live a life larger than ourselves. Um, you know, nurture our minds with the arts, nature, and good company. And ultimately, it's like uh, much of Bruce's work, it's about trying to make the world a better place and giving opportunities to people so that they can live fair and equitable lives. I am blessed to have thrown this new book into an ocean that is adopted by people like Mia Funk. It's really quite astonishing. And I started this tale today about walking a beach and self-actualization. If you listen to any of the hundreds of podcasts that Mia Funk has up for free, you can learn about these 100 plus lives and how they self-actualized. I think her gift as a host is she gives people the space to tell their storyline on how they tried to give back to society or culture or anywhere. So I highly recommend these series. So uh, about a month ago, I maybe two months ago, I wrote a piece for the Times Union that I'm now going to present uh, to this larger global audience of Mia Funk. The Times Union, as you all know, is our capital district newspaper. The spirit of capitalism in this swift and severe world exceeds the abilities of any tyrant. I am talking about the irreversible accumulated force in social history since World War II. It is the speed of the internet, 
the 24-7 news cycle, and the retaliation of corporations that want peace that is all so new and mixed in this ocean of today. The spirit of modern global capitalism, relentless and fierce, outflanks the number of tanks or the number of supersonic rockets Vladimir Putin may have. And it outflanks the numbness and blindness of his fearful soldiers. In my books, especially the last five books, I have documented how the punishments of capitalism roll with a force and a momentum fiercer than the normal tactical and physical responses to a tyrant's aggression. This is the higher fact in current history, a log that does not get thrown to the beach to dry out. I f first wrote this reflection a week into the invasion of Ukraine. And I now realize, after all these horrible months of death and brutality, it echoes the grounds for hope in my new book that I hope to bring to you. And it also echoes a book of mine called World Inc. that I traveled the world with since it's in 10 foreign editions. But what's new is how fast these corporations are responding to social prejudice and social stupidity. So I, I do believe as a popular social historian that there's two kinds of people in the world. There's the people who are creative and positive and supportive and the artists and family people, and then there's also the knuckleheads. And, and our job is to box out the knuckleheads so they don't get the rebound, right? So what I want to say here to you is that the argument that I call social response capitalism is more true and impactful than our ideology, than our ideology about Democrats or Republicans, our ideology about what the European Union can do versus what the Scandinavians want to do versus the new world order. This feature that's changing the world and changing the ocean of our time is the white canary of hope in the dismal coal mine of advanced industrialism. The companies of the Fortune 500 collectively are now larger in dollars and more impactful than any nation state. That's a kind of Spalding Gray piece of good news. These firms want something we want. They want the peaceful exchange of commerce and commodities, not war and the barriers and expense of prejudice. So in this new book, you'll find a whole chapter about one of the weirdest companies I've ever studied, Unilever. You know, Unilever bought not only the Ben and Jerry's across the street, but they have 300 global brands like Ben and Jerry's. They'll, they'll buy some sort of hippie innovator and then they globalize them so you can now buy Ben and Jerry's ice cream in Africa, right? So I spent uh, about uh, two years studying Unilever and I've come to conclude in this book, even though I don't use the metaphor, that this firm which is now changing social history in 192 countries at once, larger than the representation of the United Nations or the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund, if you look at the wealth creation of Unilever because of what people like to do, which is use Dove smoke, Dove soap to clean their bodies or eat Ben and Jerry's ice cream. I want to get you thinking about how that force in Unilever is what's going to defeat Putin. All right? So the social response capitalism is very complicated and easy to miss the canary's message because there is a web of supply chain interdependencies around the world that supplies these top 500 to 5,000 firms. And this new world order of essentially liberal and open internet-based democracy will not tolerate Putin and his czar-like mindset. The social response capitalism we're seeing now in punishing actions against Putin are a new form of competitive capitalism, very different than the Donald Trump speculative capitalism, very different than the crash and burn beachside capitalism of the past. Thank God 
Milton Friedman has had his funeral. After 50 years of deceiving what the purpose of capitalism is, I hope you see my last five books are trying to talk about a social openness and a social inclusion in companies like Unilever, Toyota, um, other clients like Merck. They have taught me to throw away my prejudices about their purpose. Today, more than 150 of the major firms of the world stopped economic exchanges that they had it with Russia. So the giant polluter and oil company, BP, is an intimate climate of mine, a client of mine. So the weekend of Putin's invasion, I'm part of the 150 email trail that BP is talking with the world about what to do. It includes 75 board members that I'm a part of called competent boards. And the people are going back and forth. You can hardly even understand it. And BP decides by Sunday, right, the day, the second day, to dis disavow their investments in Russia. 19.8% they own of Rosnov, the Russian oil company. They severed a fifth of their wealth off instantly for social response. Now, it's important to be cynical and not to be a corporate apologist. And it's important to note that you can often do it not just by studying the cost of the money of a decision. This cost BP about 8% of their proven reserves. So it's going to have a negative stock effect in the future. But I was on the email trail, not the meeting calls, but on the email trail, where Bernard Looney, the Irishman who's their current CEO, decided to resign from the board of this Russian giant by Sunday at 10 a.m. And an even more reluctant oil man that I had worked for before called Bob Dudley, who was mostly concerned about safety, also resigned. In other words, Putin's stupidity hurt the oligarchs instantly, the people who run that firm, and Gazpro, which you'll also hear about when you read the news. Now, what does this mean? I mean, what, what does this new world mean? It's very different than what you even study in business schools or international business. For the sake of a social response, not for the sake of business benefit, these 150 companies and thousands of suppliers decided to punish Putin. So I interview the Treasury of the United States. I interview some European treasurers. I read the Financial Times of London. I read to see if this is fog on a beachside or is this real. And I'm happy to report that we have verified that Russia is now worth, the Russian economy is now worth 22 to 25 percent less of what it was before he started the war. So you can imagine what Americans would do as oil price goes up from four to five dollars and as their discretionary money dings one percent of their wealth. What Putin has done hurt the Russian people 25 percent of their wealth. So social response capitalists calculated that and I want Mia Funks and our audiences to realize that this is a strange new world where capitalism and the needs of society are more osmotically related than ever before. Now I think this is good news for those seeking social change in diversity and inclusion, in climate change, and many other things that normally are advocated through policy. And I'd like to open it up to your inputs on this concept after I tell you about an 80-year-old mentor I have whose name is um, Bill Novelli. And Bill Novelli had uh, graduated from University of Pennsylvania in ancient history. I think the Greeks were still in control at that point. And um, he worked in ads. He worked for the most successful female ad executive for a while. And then he formed his own company with a man seven years older than him called Porter 
and he eventually, at age 45, sold Porto Novelli for enough money that, like Ben Franklin, he never had to work again. But what does Bill Novelli do? Well, he spends his next 35 years helping society. He becomes the CEO of ARP, the largest association representing elderly people, the American Association of Retired Persons. And he extends that membership to people 60 instead of people 65, so that ARP becomes a powerhouse of influencing healthcare for the elderly. Um, what does Novelli say when I ask him questions about Putin and about making Putin pay for what he's done? Now, interestingly enough, Times Union didn't allow me to use the title Punishing Putin. They made a much softer title. The Guardian wants to use, in London, the term Punishing Putin. So there is a kind of ideology issue about where you appear in publications. But Novelli says, and he's written a beautiful book that I recommend you all check out if you're environmentalists or social advocates or people interested in social change. His book is called Good Business. So I interview him on Putin and he says, companies on the world stage often must decide when to take a stand on political and moral issues. The public just doesn't notice it. They have governments, consumers, employees, and others to contend with, but they choose the best path when they adhere to their corporate and human values. That's Novelli, not me. This is what I write about in my new book. Social response capitalists compete on human talent, distribution, quality technologies, and social needs. The needs for more efficient automobiles, like the Toyota hybrid train. The need for more comprehensive health care for the disadvantaged and the elderly. They're now competing consciously on social response capitalism. And I think, before I overkill this, let me make one set of caveats as a social historian. I am certain that what I'm telling you will not stop the thousands dying now in Ukraine. I had a Ukrainian aunt, and I feel those deaths. The Russian troops will still kill many hundreds, if not thousands more. But what I'm saying to you is that it's economic pain that will help the oligarchs and others in political power in Russia finally defeat Putin. It's not us. It's not Biden. It's not the European Union. It's those people who begin to distrust the despot. Now, this takes time, but it is having an impact. Like I told you, the US Treasury also estimates that the damage is 22 to 28 percent. And so I wanted to talk with you about this, because there's two theories. The first theory is don't poke at a mad bear. Let the freaking despots survive. The other approach is use government policy to cage the bear. But what I'm trying to tell you is what social response capitalists do is they defeat the bear through 10,000 nearly invisible cuts. So does anybody have any thoughts about that? We'd like to talk to you, me and I. Eddie, I know that it's always Eddie. I can count on Eddie as a development and businessman. If we, if we want to have Mia be able to capture any of that audio, you would need to be on this mic. So just come on up and then. Sure. Thank you for being here, Lou and Eddie. You might want to get a big one to do music after this. Thank you for using Mia. Sure. I feel there is a disconnect with the social response capitalism and the, uh, the policy that surrounds us currently. And I'm hoping it self-corrects, but um, I really look to you, Bruce and Mia, to lead. We just, I, I kind of feel we're on the other side of the fence just watching everything unfold with no real control. Um, we can hope for the best. And we see as uh, everyone loves the beach, and we feel the waves. It's, it's great, but 
I feel it's stressed. And uh, I'm just wondering if there's any, any foretelling of how we could, you know, come through it where it's, it's, it's more like Putin is down and the crazy is down. There's less obstructions and all the good things you mentioned about the truth will come out. And I just feel my only comment is it. I'm concerned about the policy, the social responsive policies. The government is slower than the corporations. That is for sure. To cage the bear, as you say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think it's disconnected currently. That's my only That's a great comment. Does anybody want to add from that? Mia, do you want to say anything being so much in touch with youth? Uh, yes, and having some conversations with those in government too, but they don't share everything. Uh, but I think, um, I just, I'm also cautious. I think that those um, using uh, corporations to influence and to undermine, I think is good, but I think that everyone can see that there's been a change that has occurred uh, within Putin, and so sometimes you don't know if you're actually if you want to negotiate, you're negotiating with someone who is quite um, stable. And so uh, you always wonder what the reactions will be when you say poking the bear, you know, whether the action will be um, severe. So to give you a sense of how much depth you can get for free in Mia Funk's world, she actually interviews Jeffrey Sachs on this issue. Was it Jeffrey Sachs that you interviewed? Yeah, oh, I a world-renowned economist, you know, not Bruce Piasecki, but Jeffrey. You know, she gets access to the big ones. So I just want to get people to think about the resource that you're offering. One of the things I realized as a person privileged by good education and elite education is that my daughter, who's in the room here and is in medical school, has already learned the power of podcasts, right? You can supplement any source of learning by just searching a few good sources. You know, so it's a different world where you don't have to be at Harvard or Upstate Medical or at Cornell to really get the lowdown on what's happening. You can just do a podcast on it. So I hope that's another source of optimism. Before I ask another person to get up, let me clarify my position on Putin because I'm going to next tell you a story about how Michael Bloomberg, a billionaire, who I helped in the past, asked me to go check out the mayor of uh, London about a month ago because of this new book that I flung into the ocean. And I'd like to tell you that story as another story of complex hope and financial complexity. So all I'm trying to tell you, but I hope someone else gets up here and answers Eddie and others, is that I think despots can maintain anti-democratic, racist, sexist, at horror practices within the confines of their own nation. But when a Putin, a little man with big ambitions, exceeds his own self-confining walls, things will fall apart for him. So that's my bottom line. Hey, Chris Rose, you're from a bank. Do you want to comment on financial issues, or you don't have to? OK, please, please anybody else? All right, now Gordon is going to play music before I talk about this strange mayor in London.
So I already told you I'm this 15-year-old boy. I can never escape that boyhood, that beach. And I get a call from a Michael Bloomberg person because I helped them out on a climate change regulatory disclosure requirement called the Task Force on Climate-Related Disclosures that involves about 900 of the most important financial institutions. So I get this call. The mayor, meaning the mayor of our state, wants to size up Mayor Khan. And Bruce, you ask asinine questions. So you go and listen and ask some questions. That was my job. So to give you a sense of how easy it is to be intimidated by these big investment houses in Europe, you know, I'm totally underdressed. I don't have the $20,000 suit, but I <clears throat> go in and they, without me saying anything, they go, Dr. Piasecki, that's your elevator. So for those of you who've read George Orwell and are paranoid like me, it's like, holy shit, they know who I am by the time I come in the door, <laughs> all right? And I get in the elevator, and Michael Bloomberg's headquarters in Europe is the greenest building in all of Europe. It's very efficient. But there are no buttons in the elevator. And it takes me right up to this place, and I come out. I have, you know, like an academic, I have some papers. And a security agent comes up to me and says, Dr. Piasecki, this is where you'll meet the mayor. May I have your papers? You know, he's got to check if I have maybe arsenic or something bad on the papers. So he goes, and you might want to wait. The mayor's been held up. Um, here, coffee on us. Go and get a cappuccino. Now, this is the bizarre Orwellian part of the story. So there's an Italian man at the cappuccino place with another assistant, and this is a really fancy cappuccino machine. And no fooling. When they give me my cappuccino, the cover of the book that I want to show to you is on the foam of the cappuccino. I have pictures of it in my cell phone if you want to see it. It was like, I, I mean, I'm looking around totally paranoid. Do you mind if I take a picture of this? <laughs> so it kind of gives you a sense of where the world of finance is going. They know so much about you before you even get in the freaking elevator and had your first cup of coffee. So anyway, there's about 30 of us that are designed to, for different nations and different purposes, ask questions of Khan, because Khan has recently been elected as what's called the chairman of C40. And that's the 40 biggest cities in the world that are seriously trying to deal with climate change. They're trying to get particulates down of cars and and trains and buses, and it's a very concerted benchmark between, and this man who's a Pakistani, the first dark-skinned person in the history of the UK to be elected mayor, part of my assignment is to figure out, can he walk on water, or will he be crushed by the waves? All right? That's part of what I get hired to do by a lot of corporations, is do not character assassination, but character evaluation. So there's about this many people like in this room here, and Khan comes up to the microphone. And the first impression I get that I write on my report is he's not talking to the 30 people. He's talking to the world, right? He's not, he's not talking to the people in the room. He's talking to the TV camera. And the first thing he does is his eyes scan the 30 people in the room, and he looks straight at me, and he goes, I just wanted to make sure you're not Will Smith before I begin. <laughs> so he has a sense of humor. So the, I write in the report, potential prime minister, sense of humor. Because <laughs> you've got to tell a lot of jokes if you're dealing with the 40 dirtiest cities in the world. So I, I, I meet this guy, Khan, and I've got to tell you, as a book writer, when I threw this book into the world, I didn't think I was going to wind up in London with the mayor of Cannes. So my message for youth that might be listening is walk that beach, have that confidence building experience, and just start playing music and start writing. Because eventually, Mayor Khan will be relieved that you're not Will Smith. 
Now, I want to tell you that I think elected officials in general have a hard job. I'd rather sit at home and write books, right? It is a freaking hard job to have 30 nations looking at him at the same time. He was very smooth. He, he was uh, answering all our questions with wit and humor. It was almost like Ben Franklin. And I had the thought that I wanted to dedicate my next 10 years working with people like Mia Funk so that the whole world could have conversations with people like him, not just the 30 biggest representative of big investment billionaires. You know what I mean? I, I just think that if the world is really going to become democratic, they have to hear directly from these people. So that's part of what I'm trying to do with Mia, is get some more people. And I want to tell you a few more things about her as I leave Mayor Khan and start thinking about um, Van Morrison. You know how Van Morrison has that anger in him? You know, that, that, that yeah. I related that from age 15 to now. Van Morrison's my man because I can hear the anger in him. And uh, I want to say a few words about as, as, as I mellow and as Van Morrison mellowed. Because when I gave a talk in Belfast recently, one of my favorite possessions is the book that got me to Belfast also got me a signed copy of Van Morrison's lyrics. Is that not cool? That, that he was there with a little hoodie <laughs> And he had a representative give me. Ever since his wife died, he doesn't like meeting a lot of Americans. But he's there in Belfast, and he gave me his lyrics. Um, so what I want to think about now is how would Mia and I talk to very important people that actually can change the world? And I want to tell you that I find that Mia does it with grace and support. There's no confrontational touch when Mia interviewed me on my last five books. I actually said to her afterward, and this is before she gave me this 10 podcast offer, how well prepared are you? I mean, it's amazing. She had some students on that asked questions. And you know, it's not like American TV. When I go on American TV, you can tell the famous announcer hardly even read the press release, let alone the books, right? When you go on modern radio, mainstream radio is scripted. So it's more about the person asking me questions than it is about my new book. So what I, all I want to say here is that there's a creative frugality in podcasts where there could be a direct link between the host and the VIP. Right? And so Mia Funk want to point you in the direction after this show of an interview we did recently with the world famous but hardly known life term writer called James Fallows and his wife, Deb. So back in the day, when I started writing for the Washington Monthly uh, in the early 80s uh, about Love Canal and hazardous waste pollution, James Fallows was my editor. And I was always afraid to ask him questions after that, because he came up with the great title of my piece called The Surprising Solution to the Love Canal Problem. I thought I was writing about the Love Canal Problem. He said, no, Bruce, you're writing about the surprising solution to this. So I've always admired his work. He won Book of the Year for his book called National Defense. Um, he went, and as the Atlantic editor, went to Japan and lived with his wife in Japan for three years. And his book is called More Like Us, where he celebrates the disorder of America in contrast to the incredible order of Japan. He then writes a book um, that recently was on the New York Times bestseller list called Our Towns, where it's about how the debate between the West Coast and the East Coast is a little off because there are many self-reliant communities like Saratoga that I have enriched themselves and are not lost in this thing that's going on in the media. He's also coined a phrase in his work called Make America Great Again. And during the interview, he confesses to Mia, I didn't think Reagan was going to adopt. <laughs> I didn't think Trump was going to adopt. I was just trying to say, what are our values of self-reliance that are going to make America great again? So I highly recommend, if you want to hear a master 
think about the world, uh, the James Fallows and Deb Fallows. Do you want to say anything about that, Mia, before I go on? Oh, yes. I really uh, enjoyed that interview and what uh, a beautiful partnership, uh, collaboration their whole life has been. And as I know you have as well, Bruce, uh, uh, with your wife, uh, Colette. And so I just, uh, it's just lovely to see that and also their mission uh, with the Our Towns, which is a foundation as well as, you know, a, a book and a documentary. It's this whole thing. But the whole thing is an emphasis on the positive and not what divides us celebrating these towns, the wonderful initiatives that they have, um, all, they have all around America, and uh, not, not celebrating the, as you say, the, the flaws, which is all we hear in the news, but just what's working and connecting them through various initiatives. And they had a real sense of warmth and wit, didn't they, Mia? They were fun to listen to. Oh yeah, it's a real exchange, and they, they keep on, you know, there's this great back and forth, and uh, when one doesn't want to toot their own too much, <laughs> you know, James might remind Deb that, you know, she, of her accomplishment. So it, it's really lovely to right. see that. Yeah, for example, Deb wrote a very important book called Thinking in Chinese, because when they went to live in China for three years, she taught herself Mandarin. She was a dean of linguistics in Washington, D.C. And my wife introduced me to her work by saying that she wrote the best essay on work-life balance for mothers. So look up the work of Deb Fallows. Um, that particular essay for the Washington Monthly became a book that I will now read, having learned that during the interview. Dreaming in Chinese, thank you, Andrea. Yeah, yeah, it is dreaming in Chinese because she tells a story during the interview. She's very, sophisticated and balanced and has wonderful children and grandchildren. And she said, one of the strangest things about in China is it's hard to even dream what their lives are like. And women come up to her and say, what is your favorite child? And she goes, we don't answer that question in America. And, and, and she tells one story after the other where culturally, she felt like she was in an extended dream for three years. Uh, and I thought that was a very interesting observation. Thank you, Andrea. So now I want to talk a little bit, a direct passage from A New Way to Wealth so that you can get a flavor of how I deal with fact and higher fact in my writing. So, you know, Ben Franklin, he's our man. If he can't do it, no one can. He's the supercharged hero of this story. And so I start a chapter about his emphasis on frugality and being industrious. And I come to the question of water. And I had tried to create a 50 company consortium on water, but no one was willing to pay for it. Even though these huge companies all need water, there is no built in economic incentive to save water, right? So I thought to myself, how the hell is my thinking going to get to the future if people don't want to pay for caring about water? So the first decision I made was thinking about a conversation I have with my daughter through the years. Whenever she asks something of me, I say, sure, I'll do it, but that's going to cost you $17. <laughs> and so she's a wise ass, too. So half a certain while, she said, Dad, it's up to 17000 and you're never going to give me anything, and I'm never going to give you anything. <laughs> so I decided to price, with that thought of mine, my New Way to Wealth book, $17. All right? <laughs> and, you know, modern books go for $35. But I said to myself, what about those people in China? What about those people in the Gobi Desert who don't have water? What about the people in North Africa where the desert is. You know, so I had a, a global ambition in this book to write uh, a global book. So I came across a couple of instances in Israel through a podcast that showed me that modern industrial agriculture consumes wastefully 70% more water than you have to. So in Israel already, because of the nature of the desert, because of the wisdom of the people, 
and also because of the smarts of high technology, they have computer-assisted drip irrigation, which saves 50% of the 70% waste. So I don't want to give you the details of the book. I mean, in every instance of when I looked at energy or building science or agriculture or anything, there are deltas of opportunity that big in learning how to do more with less. So the whole principle of Ben Franklin being civil, innovative, diplomatic, not wasteful, frugal, and industrial is the higher fact of the book, right? The facts will come out in the book about all of these things, but I do believe solutions are there and certain nations are doing them, but we have to learn through podcasts how to spotlight the improvement. So now I come closer towards the end, both of my life and of my book history. I can see three books in me that I still want to write after finishing the 19 I did. I think I told you already that my first book out came out when I was 20, which is incredibly embarrassing to, to realize juvenilia and the arrogance of youth in those first three or four books, the stupidity and knucklehead thinking. You, you wish you could take them back, right? But you can't. They're out there. So I love about a dozen of Van Morrison's songs. And this is a passage that's one of my favorite. We are, were born before the wind and younger than the sun. And the bobby boat was one as we sail into the mystic. Smell the sea and feel the sky. Let your soul and spirit fly into the mystic. Despite his anger, Despite his rage, I think he's taught me that good writing and fine music share a lot in common. And Dylan knows this too. Others do on the beach and in the supermarkets of our soul. So I wanted to end with a completely sportive and mindless piece about Australia. Because when I took A New Way to Wealth and threw it into the ocean, I didn't think it was going to wind up in Australia. Right? I knew it would show up in the financial districts of London or in the Washington politics or in the Cosmos Club or in the Commonwealth Club of California because those were the paths my prior books went. And I only been to Australia once with my daughter when she was 16 on a book I wrote on globalization called World Inc. But this time, A New Way to Wealth got us a month-long gig coming up in September and October and my wife and I have always wanted to spend vacation time in Australia. So the, nation, the notion of the gig is such that they pay for everything, but I only work one out of five days. So that's, that's what seniority gives you is a chance to. And they also let us stay in the homes of the 600 people that elected me and my books to the Royal Society of Australia. The, the Royal Society of Australia is 600 people who have tried to make a difference in their lives. Some of them are doctors, some of them are lawyers, some of them are inventors, some of them are comedians, some of them, like my friend Pamela Griffiths that my daughter and I spent a week with, is the most famous painter of Australia. She uh, illustrates the currency on the back of the dollar and has painted each of the last prime ministers. So I want to tell you how I deal with this new stress of having different nations check out my books. I didn't have Australia in mind when I walked that first beach. I didn't even have Europe in mind when I walked that beach. So what I want to tell you is it doesn't pay to use the internet to the point where it makes you paralyzed. Like when I started to research where they want me to speak, I realized that one of the town halls is where they brought Charles Darwin to speak. Holy shit. I can't write as well as The Voyage of the Beagle or The Origin of Species or his last book. I don't know if you know, it took Charles Darwin 11 years to write his book on worms. His last book in life is on soil and worms. So I'm a little intimidated. So I've developed this piece to deal with 
Australia before Andrew and I get there. Like an emu, I will stand tall when the Australian questions break waves on me. When they ask, why are Americans so damn competitive? Why are Americans so stupidly ideological? Why do Americans permit so many sports knuckleheads to run companies like Elon Musk? Or why do you allow so many guns to misfire? These are the kinds of questions I've already gotten from the founders of the Royal Society. I have no answers here, so I, my strategy will be to stare at them with the blank, black eye of an emu and try and indicate that I have sharp toes and then trot along and get the hell out of the answer, right? But of course, these are serious people. And their venture to have me think about climate change in a continent that's going dry or wet in very abnormal ways in its 50 million history. I, I think I have to come up with something a little better than just the emu trick. So I want you to picture the scene just like you pictured me at the beginning of the Long Island Beach. I'm going to be wearing some pretty fancy outback boots. And I already bought here in Saratoga at the Outback store, one of their fancy Aussie leather hats for Andrea and myself. And my hope is that the great majority of people won't even realize I'm American, so they don't ask those questions, right? I mean, it's not my job to defend what has happened to our nation. So my wife and I have already agreed to have afternoon tea with some of these people, because this Royal Society is very UK-ish, right? I expect the people to be very proper and wealthy and, in a way, different than you can tell. I'm in a mischievous little boy, even at 67. So Andrew and I have to prepare to be thrown out a couple of these homes. So uh, luckily we have some backup hotels if we have to go. Now, the last thing I want to tell you is there's two other marsupials that personify my preparation for the world tour that includes Australia. And the first is the koala bear. I don't know. I mean, every girl I know in her teenage years find them cute. But what I observe about them is they're just like riders, book riders especially. They're very good at climbing the tree to get to the gum leaves. And they're incredibly efficient to getting high up in the tree but they have no ability for them to come down the tree because of their fat asses. Just like a rider, they can't, they can't see because of their ascent, they can't back out of where they got to, right? I think you should check out videos on koala bears trying to come down gum trees. They actually fall into each other because they can't see where they're going. So that's going to be my excuse. I'm going to try and say, I can't answer that question because I can't see beyond my fat ass. When I watch the life of the book writers I really admire, the really great writers like James Perini or Gay Talese or James Fallows, or the women writers that are, fill my shelves like when I was in Ireland, the woman who wrote Country Girl gave me her book. I think about the kangaroo. Book after book, these really masterful writers use energy. They use less energy like a kangaroo does. They're even more efficient than an African marathon runner. That is because the kangaroo, like writers, are shaped by the land or the beach where they were born. They can never escape it, really. The sensibility of trauma that shaped them in their early creativity that made a Bob Dylan or made people of true renown will allow them to bounce through three million miles, which is what the kangaroo does. It, its territory is bound by only ocean and only by beach. But they prance when they run, if you watch a kangaroo, like a best-selling author.
you should have seen how I pranced when I was on the New York Times bestseller list or how I pranced when I was on the Wall Street Journal list. It's so embarrassing to all my friends because you realize you're like a kangaroo for a little bit of time. You don't stay up there for very long. And then you're like the fat-ass koala bear. I understanding in reading the great books why Australia decided to leave Africa and why it decided to leave Antarctica to be completely by itself. In the end, being a book writer, even though I'm a happy family man and a happy business owner, there's a lonely majesty to it. And like a book writer, when you look at yourself in the mirror across 50 years, the only satisfaction you have looking at all that juvenilia and all those mistakes is a sense of a complete corpus. You have transformed your physical body into a word body. And that word body, like a stick, can either sink at the shoreline or float across many oceans. And you've done this in a single freaking lifetime. So I want to end my time with you by reflecting on my second religious experience that Colette and I had with an emu, my first trip to Australia, because it really brought me back to size. I was with Colette on this first book tour right after the bestseller. The best way to describe my psyche at the time was stupidly youthful and invincible until I met this emu. So I had written in 1976, I'm looking forward to looking back, but the inescapability of any future blinds us in a freshness. So it's me and the emu, but unfortunately Colette's right next to it, and the emu is occasionally looking at her, and I could see in his black eyes he's asking, should I pluck out her eyes first, or should I pluck out dad's eyes? When you're next to an emu, and you realize how big and fast they are, I said to myself, dear God, I'm looking forward to looking back because, sacred and immortal one, if I survive this encounter with my daughter, I promise you, if you don't pluck out her eyes, I promise you, I'll write another three books. And I'll throw them in the ocean, and you determine if they sink or not. So I was there with my daughter, and this is what my prayer was like. Now, the emo to dad seemed like he was going to strike. I couldn't believe that the Australian keepers didn't put a fence between me as a tourist and these emu. They just let you wander in these open parks. And I am convinced that this emu didn't go to Harvard, didn't go to Cornell, wasn't well educated, but he was pissed at me. And he looked like a Mack truck. He was coming towards me and he was standing very close to me. So I began to pray in my mind, back to my mother's faith and the foam on the Long Island beach, where I had first made promises with myself. I began to crash in my imagination. Fear and fog formed in my brain. And the only thing I could do was pray. So in my mind, the conversation with the emu god went like this, an emu embodies the E in the universe. An emu contains all the M's of this universe. An emu stands tall with a U of the universe. Amen. And the emu turned around and left. And that's why I'm here today to tell you. I'll write a couple more books. Thank you. So Gordon's going to come and play some music, and uh, we thank you for your patience to listen to these tales. And Bruce, uh, will we open it out for uh, personal memories of the audience and relation to music that was meaningful to them? I know they have another concert coming up at 5, so Sarah, what do we have, five minutes or what? Uh, no, we have, well, um, it depends on how long your song is. How long is your song? Uh, we can go till four Short and sweet. So we have about five minutes, uh, Mia. Please take over. Oh, whatever is good because I don't, Gordon was playing. Well, I think that you know we've just enjoyed listening to your um, 
the, the music of your language, Bruce. And so I want to open it out to people to ask them what music was meaningful to you, you know, what music like might have turned your anger and lifted it into something beautiful, you know, how music has uh, uh, reminded you of the special moments in your life. Excellent, Mia. Let's do a shout out. What music means something to you all? I'm going to call on my. Yeah, Colette, I'm going to call on you if you don't mind. You know how your dad always calls on you? All right, this is a funny one, I guess. But um, I don't know if you've ever watched Brother Bear, but Phil Collins' music on the Disney soundtrack is one of my favorites. Um, specifically, I think it's called On My Way by Phil Collins. That is one of my favorites. It's just such a light, like, summery song, and you can go play it and listen to it, and it's a good start to whatever you want to do for the day. And this is from a girl who had to spend time in emergency rooms watching severed limbs and everything. So it's good to know Phil Collins paid, Colette. Thanks a lot, my dear. Does anybody else want to come up and answer Mia's question? Sarah does. Uh oh. It's, you know, it's hard to imagine any part of my life that doesn't have a musical soundtrack to it. Um, from, you know, being a tiny child in, in church uh, to listening to my sister's Columbia Records collections that would come in the mail. But I think it was when uh, I was in my teens and I came across a singer-songwriter named Holly Near who uh, sings political anthems and ballads that I began to understand how a story could be completely transformed by being accompanied by a melody. And that it, it becomes something that's not a newspaper headline, it's not a newspaper story, it's not just a battle cry, but it's something that works on all parts of your mind and your heart. And the melody itself helps you remember the words and it can be very compelling and it certainly was music that changed my course in life. That's a beautiful answer. I want to go like this to that one. I won't be too silly, but I'll say that answer was near to my life. Anybody else want to comment? Frank Weaver, you want to comment? Okay. Go ahead. Bruce, what about you? Oh, in terms of music? As Frank gets ready, it's Bob Dylan. It's Bob Dylan, Tangled Up in Blue, where I wonder if she still has red hair. My wife does have red hair, and in Tangled in Blue, he takes us like in his song, Hurricane, five minutes, 38 seconds. Those are the songs that I listen to almost every week. I do have to let you know that I drive my wife crazy because when I work out at home, I listen to Joe Cocker. Yes. So, when I, 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 I lived a very, kind of the opposite of you, a very stable, suburb, suburban, normal life which meant I knew nothing and had no challenges. But at the age of 17, I decided I was going to leave New Jersey for the summer, find a job up here at Lake George, and just get away from home. And I ended up working at a restaurant on Route 9, but I had to find a place to live. So up the road, I, I, I knocked from door to door. And um, they, they said, well, you know what? We don't have any rooms, but Go up the hill, find, find Lena. <laughs> Not this Lena, a different Lena. And I finally went up the hill in Diamond Point, and big sign said, Home of the Opera. <laughs> oh, wow. It was the Lake George Opera when it, in the early days um, where they actually would perform entire, it wasn't just singing on stage, they were performing the operas in English and so I spent, that, that was my first exposure to, to opera, like Mozart and Tosca, and, you know, all of that good stuff. So the first opera I ever saw was Tosca. So that music has stuck with me ever since. It's beautiful. Yeah. As we turn to Gordon, I want to say this is Frank Weaver. You could search the internet and find out that he is the man who brought the music of James Joyce to the world. He produced CDs 
of the music of James Joyce. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Mia, for checking in from Paris. Yeah, thanks, everyone. We'll see you. Thank you. Yay, Mia Farmer. It was a pleasure. Yes, and thank you, uh, uh, Gordon and Bruce and Sarah and the whole team at uh, Cafe Lina and all those I can't see in the audience. But um, it will be a pleasure to, to connect with you and learning your stories. It's, it's just a beautiful listening experience. Good night. Sorry, I can't hear. I can't hear. And thanks, Bruce, for inviting me. Oh, my pleasure, Gordon. Thank special. you for thanks. taking the trip. So I think.